Welcome, this is, This Week in Prophecy, with, James Jacob Prash. Today is April 25th, 2020, from the United Kingdom, Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. This is Jacob Prash speaking to you for Moriel Ministries. Welcome to This Week in Prophecy. Actually, that's become a bit of a misnomer. Because of the coronavirus, we've been putting out much material addressing the virus phenomena and the reactions to it, and we've had tons and tons of questions concerning any theological or prophetic implications for it. So most of what we've been doing in nearly a month, for nearly a month now, has been focused on the coronavirus and this aftermath and what's likely to be in the future concerning it and looking at any aspects related to biblical prophecy that we can determine. We've therefore been, like many other people, ignoring most of the news. When you look at the news media on internet or otherwise, you see that it's so dominated by the coronavirus, there's very little reporting on anything else. But other things are indeed happening. And there are sinister nations and forces afoot who are trying to capitalize on the virus while people's attention and international focus is on the virus and diverted away from them for the actions they are taking. We see this globally. We certainly see it with China and its increased military and naval activities in the South China Sea, now confronting Malaysia, Vietnam, and drawing a response from the United States and Australia. That's one example, but there are others, especially, as we shall see, this week in prophecy in the Middle East. Again, so much attention is being paid to the coronavirus and its uh, adjuncts that other things are being overlooked. So it's time now for us to look at some of those other things that have been overlooked. They are important, and they are of prophetic significance. This week in prophecy, Iran announced and presented publicly two new designs of Iranian drones now in mass production. They are jet powered and it is claimed by Iran that they rival the best drone technology held by the United States, by Israel, or by Russia. That is their claim. We're not exactly positive how accurate or how honest their claims are, but essentially we have the Abadil 3 drone and the Karar drone. The drones have a range of 1,500 kilometers. They fly at about 12,000 feet, and they travel at 900 kilometers per hour approximately 500 miles an hour, almost the same as a commercial jetliner. The United States Navy shot down an Iranian drone last year after Iranian drone flew over an American aircraft carrier. The USS Boxer downed one last year. This new generation, however, Iran claims, raises the status of Iran's performance potential in the Middle East against the United States and against Israel. And they were premiered this week in prophecy. Amir Khatami, the Iranian defense minister, gave his usual saber-rattling speech, but pointing out that these drones, similar to American ones, can launch missiles from the drones themselves. While the Karar is sort of like a cruise missile, it hits the target and explodes itself. The Abalir 3 can actually fire a missile from the drone. Now, this can be a game changer if it is true, and it raises the stakes in the Middle East considerably. What is also of significance is Iran is looking to deploy these things further afield. We need to be careful if they're deployed in Lebanon or if they are deployed in Syria. Recently, Iran and its allies of Hezbollah have removed their headquarters from Damascus, which is so close to being in range of Israeli, even ground-based artillery, up to Aleppo, a formerly Christian city in the north of 
Syria. Something is happening that Iran is reposturing and redeploying its forces in Syria. We need to watch this, especially if the drones are deployed there. However, the drones will certainly be deployed in Yemen, presenting a further threat to Saudi Arabia. This situation is very intense. It is concurrent with other events. The United States in Iraq has been consolidating its bases into several large bases. It has been closing bases and consolidating them. Uh, it has withdrawn the USS Truman, an aircraft carrier, from the Persian Gulf to the Pacific because of the coronavirus outbreak on the USS Roosevelt, the carrier Roosevelt. So they had to remove one carrier from the Middle East and deploy it in the Pacific. This leaves a gap in naval air power. However, there is more than sufficient ground-based air power in the Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, and elsewhere, should the United States come into a conflict with Iran. The removal of the Truman was not a symbolic gesture. It was a gesture not signaling retreat or withdrawal, but rather just the practical problems of the coronavirus when a ship's crew became infected. Now, of course, the Iranians are telling their people that it's showing that the Americans are afraid of Iran and are pulling away. That is what they're saying. At the same time, they're only saying this in response to the fact that the White House announced that it has given the U.S. Navy full go-ahead to open fire on any Iranian naval vessels or patrol boats of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard that further attempt to harass U.S. military or other ships in the Straits of Hormuz or in the Gulf. Again, a conflict could be pending. Even without the Truman, the American might is still available should they indeed need it. It would be devastating for Iran, but Iran is being devastated already. The drop in oil prices and the embargoes have brought their economy even further into crisis. Now, even if they could export the oil, no one would want to buy it. It accounts for approximately 20% of Iran's economy and exports. But let's look at this further. What we see happening this week in prophecy is the following. In Israel, a new government was announced. It is a coalition between Kahor Velevan and the Kud of Benjamin Netanyahu. Because of the coronavirus, combined with the possibility of a fourth general election in Israel, Benny Gantz has caved in and formed a coalition with Benjamin Netanyahu, something he said he would never do. As a result of this, his two primary partners in the Kohova Levan coalition, uh, Telim and also Yesh Atid, literally, there is a future, left center parties have pulled out. Now, the repercussions of this will be interesting. Gantz will maintain the position as speaker of the Knesset of the Israeli parliament for 18 months, while Benjamin Netanyahu continues as Rosh HaMemshalah, as prime minister for 18 months, and then it'll be 18 months of Benny Gantz. It is indeed a coalition, but it's done something that's very interesting. It has moved Israel to the strategic right by shedding his left center parties in order to form the coalition. Benny Gantz only has his right center faction in league with Benjamin Netanyahu's nationalist conservatives from the Likud. So it was announced this week in prophecy that Israel would continue with its plan to follow the Trump proposals, the Trump peace plan which would give Israel sovereignty over its settlements in the West Bank. 
Dramatically, however, this week in prophecy, another statement was made by American Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who was a, a born again believer. Mr. Pompeo stated that the status of the West Bank will be Israel's decision, that anything by way of concern the United States has, it will share diplomatically and privately. It will not be a public issue. And he's basically given Israel, if not carte blanche, something approaching it and how it deals with the West Bank. Meanwhile, the United States having halted most of its support to the Palestinian Authority because of its support for terror, has released $5 million to the Palestinian Authority specifically to fight the effects of coronavirus. Mr. Pompeo said he hopes the money will get to the people where it belongs. Another reason the United States has curtailed its support of the Palestinian Authority, apart from its anti-Americanism and its sponsoring of terror indirectly, is the fact that so much of the money that is given is pilfered and stolen by the Palestinian Authority, basically the political party of the late Yasser Arafat. This is the same kind of behavior, the same practice that bought support for Hamas in Gaza. The Palestinian Authority was looting, stealing, and pilfering money given to help their own people and to build an infrastructure in Gaza, and the people turned in desperation to Hamas because of the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. Buried in a sea of its own division, now the Trump administration is giving further license to the Israeli government, which now has a right-wing faction in the partnership and a right-center faction in the partnership. So Israel is going to strategically and in areas of defense move further to the right. Interestingly, it is Mr. Gantz who's given control of the portfolios of the defense ministry, as well as the justice ministry and the foreign ministry. Now, this is very significant. Although Mr. Netanyahu controls the treasury, the police, and things like transport. The other factor, not only did Mr. Gantz lose his left center coalition partners, the religious parties, who the Likud has always needed to get elected, have for the moment been disenfranchised. The political blackmail they normally practice may continue, but not to the same degree. They cannot threaten to leave the government and bring the government down if they don't get the concessions they want and demand because they're no longer in the government. One of the policy positions of Mr. Gantz, quite rightly, is to end exemptions for military service for ultra-Orthodox Jews, requiring them to serve in Hezder Yeshiva, in the religious branch of the military, as so many more moderate Orthodox Jews do. We have described in the past the financial blackmail, the political blackmail, and the social parasitism of the religious parties, demanding everything from more and more subsidies for the yeshivas, even when the nation was in serious economic crisis, to not having to serve in the military. This week in prophecy, they were rioting again against coronavirus control restrictions on distancing. The highest areas in Israel hit with the coronavirus with the most infections are the three areas with the highest ultra-Orthodox populations. Meir Sharim neighborhood in Jerusalem, Bet Shemesh in the area we know as the Shvila between the coastal plain and Jerusalem, and the third, B'nai Brach, the ultra-Orthodox satellite city of Tel Aviv. One third, one third of the population of B'nai Brach, all ultra-Orthodox Jews, 
are coronavirus infected. Absolutely amazing. There are equivalent high infection rates in Lakewood, New Jersey, in Brooklyn, and in elsewhere where there are high Hasidic and ultra-Orthodox Jewish populations. The virus is getting the better of them at the moment through their refusal to comply with health regulations concerning distancing and so forth. Secondly, they are not in the government coalition at the moment. This is what's happening. The best thing that could probably happen in terms of Israeli sovereignty over the West Bank and Jerusalem, in terms of dealing with the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, and in terms of the preservation of Israeli democracy against the anti-democratic religious parties, is for the coalition between the Likud and Kohol Velavan to become something permanent. This, however, at the present moment does not seem likely. As we speak, there are further moves afoot in the Israeli High Court to state that Benjamin Netanyahu cannot hold office as long as he is under indictment or investigation for corruption. His trial is set to begin very shortly on these corruption allegations, May 20, 20th, uh, sorry, May 24th, the trial will begin. He believes he will be completely exonerated. Also, there are the draft laws, another factor in the coalition. It is proving to be something very, very interesting. But the coalition is fragile, and the religious parties will be needed in the future for the Likud to ever form a government should the coalition fail. Now that the left center parties are gone from it, and the religious parties are gone from the government in a major way, it is my hope, and I think it should be our prayer, that the coalition will work out and evolve into something more permanent, bringing stability that will alienate the religious parties and their political and financial blackmail. And what most Israelis see as their embedded cowardice in their refusal to serve in the military. Again, social parasitism is the way secular Israelis look upon the ultra-Orthodox, even moderate Orthodox Jews do not agree with what they do. But let us continue this week in prophecy. It is quite a situation. We warned this week in prophecy that you're going to see things happening in Turkey. Well, it is happening. A battle between the municipal, that is the urban city governments, and Recep Erdogan's pro-Islamist regime. The two largest cities, of course, are Istanbul and Ankara. The mayor of, of both of those cities, Ekrem Imamoglu of Istanbul, and also Mansour Yavis in Ankara, last year in election victories, displaced religious parties who are trying to bring a Turkish version of Sharia into civil and criminal law more radically than has existed in the past. They stood against it. However, Recep Erdogan pushes the Islamist agenda. Once more, the coronavirus knows no limits no boundaries, recognizes no nations or peoples. It is a problem in Turkey as it is everywhere. A massive fundraising drive to combat the effects of the virus and to help the poor and disenfranchised affected by it in Turkey, and Turkey has a lot of poor people and its population of 83 million, only raised $245 million dollars that's not a lot of money for a nation of 83 million people. And most of that money, in fact, nearly all of it, came from government-owned enterprises, 
not from the public. The mayors of the cities who are not Islamist, Ankara and Istanbul, were beginning their own fundraising efforts to help the poor of their cities affected by corona, and Erdogan has used the power of central government to ban it. Erdogan, in the opinion of some commentators, and it's difficult to argue with them, has aligned himself with COVID-19 against the secularists in his own country, even though they are democratically elected. He is willing to stop them from raising money to help the poor and needy affected by the coronavirus, when his efforts to raise money largely came to nothing. In fact, they failed. The only money he has, by and large, is money contributed indirectly by the government, government-owned enterprises. Turkey is under God's judgment this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, something unique has happened. Once more, things become eclipsed by what's happening with corona as the amount of deaths in the United States has reached 51,000 and one out of six American workers are now not working. Now, this is not just America, it is global, and we don't know how many people are infected or have died in China. We just saw that the Chinese government is not being honest about it. Either are the Iranians in all likelihood. But that was basically hogging the attention of the international media. Something else was happening that did get some attention, but its repercussions have not gotten enough. For the first time, oil prices have gone into negative territory. We're speaking of oil at about $40 a barrel, not for sale, but the producers paying refineries and storers to buy it. I'll give you $40 if you take this barrel of oil off my hands and store it. This is crazy. Future prices, future prices have exceeded the spot market prices in Rotterdam. This is without precedent. It is indeed bad for small American fracking companies, certainly. To stop fracking or to stop pumping oil is an expensive venture in itself. You can't just turn off the tap all that easily. You will damage the pumping infrastructure. It will take time and money to revamp it. It's not easy to turn off the tap or to deactivate a well. It is costly, and it is costly to reactivate it. Quite a problem. The world is running out of storage space. It's storing oil in tankers. It's storing oil wherever it can. This has benefited China. But the two countries responsible for it, who are working to destroy the American fracking industry, are Russia and Saudi Arabia. OPEC and Russia lost the capacity to have oil prices at $80 to $100 a barrel, lost the capacity because of American fracking. Their response is to lower their own prices so low that American fracking companies cannot survive and then revive OPEC and re resuscitate Russia's oil industry. But this is costing them immense amount of money. Saudi Arabia cannot meet its budgetary requirements. It is having to cut back on social services, as is Mr. Putin. Now, Mr. Putin by defaulting on debt to other countries, managed to build up a cash reserve. But this cash reserve he's built up should be invested in expanding Russian infrastructure and the economy to stop it from continuing as a petro state reliant on oil and natural gas. Instead, he's simply using it and allowing it to become increasingly depleted in order to keep prices artificially low to hurt the Americans. It is a quintessential case 
of cutting off one's nose to spite one's face. In the long term, it's reckless. But in the short term, we see the effects. The rupal is plummeting. If it continues this way very much longer, you will have one rupal to one penny. One cent American will equal one rupal. At the present time, it's approximately 70. But it can't continue like this without repercussions on a near collapse, if not a collapse, of the Russian rupal. Saudi Arabia has a major problem with youth unemployment. Without investment, it is going to have social and political unrest, yet its revenues are down as a result of its own action, that is, its own overproduction and flooding the market. The United States can likely survive this, and certainly the United States can survive it overall oil industry, even though small producers may be hurt. The Trump administration is using the low prices to replenish the American reserves, which is a good move. But the time of high oil prices is not coming back, no matter what Mr. Putin or the Saudi Arabians do about it. It simply cannot come back. Things have changed permanently. So permanently that with countries like Iran and, and, and Venezuela, not even in the business hardly anymore, prices have still remained very, very low. Uh, despite tensions in the Persian Gulf, prices remain lower than they've ever been. The game is over. It is a desperate effort by Russia and by Saudi Arabia to try to revive something that's not going to come back by artificial life support means they're trying to mimic what it used to be, but will not be again. But it can do its damage. One beneficiary from this will be China that needs to import most of its oil. It's buying it for almost nothing to fuel its industries. This happens at a time when China's own economy and its manufacturing output is declining at record levels, the lowest levels we've seen in decades, with more to come because of an underreported internal debt crisis. We've spoken about these things before, but this week in prophecy, what has happened in the oil markets is incredible. It's hurting the United States, but it's really hurting the countries who are causing it, Russia and Saudi Arabia, and they can afford it less than the United States can in the long term. But it's happening, and it's happening this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, we had a position published by a legal professor of public affairs from Harvard Law School, a left-wing institution, and it targeted something we warned would be targeted, specifically homeschooling. The numbers of homeschoolers have increased from 2% to 4%, with about 90% of homeschoolers in the United States being people who uphold traditional, scripturally-based Judeo-Christian values, particularly evangelical Christians, saved Christians, broadly speaking. Not all, but most. We have also pointed out in the past that it is cottage industries that create the most jobs. Mass production, those jobs have gone to countries where labor-intensive industries will have lower wages or robotics will take over. That is largely happening. There is a reliance on cottage-based industries. More and more people working from home by computer, et cetera. As the economy will be more home-based, more of education needs to be home-based. We have a categorically failed public school system. The United States spends considerably more than most countries on education, considerably more, and every year the results get worse. We have a public school system in the United States designed to fail. It is not there primarily to educate. 
It is there for purposes of social engineering to force the whole homosexual agenda and multiculturalism and multi-faith agenda down the throat of impressionable children irrespective of the beliefs and convictions of their families. And it is there to provide jobs for the educational bureaucracy and the members of the teachers' unions, which do not represent good teachers, only bad ones, who it gets tenured. Most of them come from the lower 40% of their class, many from the lowest 20% of their class, as opposed to countries such as Singapore and Finland, where the teaching profession is highly competitive along the lines of medicine and law in the United States. It's a degraded profession. The teachers unions in the United States are essentially a political campaign fund for the Democratic Party. Hence, the Democratic Party and the progressivists have a vested interest in perpetuating a school system that's failing. It helps keep minorities, particularly blacks, as part of a permanent underclass. We have seen the Blasio's war against charter schools in New York, even though charter schools give children, most notably minority children, black children, higher test results and a better education than in the failed and failing public school system of New York City. Yet he makes wars against something that succeeds in order to perpetuate something that continues and will continue to fail. This is de Blasio. Well, this week, this professor of public interest law, Elizabeth Bartolet, she says the following, homeschool is a risk to children. It is a risk to children for the following reasons. It deprives them of a meaningful education. How can a school system that sees lower math and science scores year after year after year, and the more money you put into it, the more it fails, how can that be called a meaningful education? She doesn't specify. What she means is, if you do not agree with her social engineering, progressivist agenda, it's failing, not because it's failing academically. It is failing academically, but that's not what she means. She avoids the fact that it's failing academically, and she calls it a meaningful education. How can something that has failed and is failing miserably be called a meaningful education? You'll have to ask Harvard Law School professor. She said, again, it fails to protect children from potential child abuse. Public schools protect children from child abuse by their parents? How does that work? Well, she says that teachers are mandated reporters of child abuse. What about the Catholic schools where the teachers are the abusers? What about the instances in public and funded schools where the abusers are teachers? including women teachers. But no, she ignores that. Teachers are there as policemen to protect children from their parents. In fact, the people who homeschool children are people of religious conviction, and they're not the kind of people generally who would sexually abuse their own children. Then, she says, it prevents them from contributing to a democratic society. Her demand that government should outlaw homeschooling, that is an attack on democracy. This is a terrible, terrible woman. Now, I hope she gets saved. I hope she comes to faith in Yeshua, her Messiah, and I hope her position changes. But I also hope the Almighty raises his hand against this wicked woman. We've been warning for some time that homeschooling was going to become attacked by forces that are demonically animated, and she is one of them. These are the things taking place this week in prophecy.
We're all concentrating on the virus. I understand there's multiple opinions, there's conspiracy theories galore, and we have a number of other videos dealing with this, and we also have a discussion with John Haller, John Anglis, and myself together with Amos Ferrero from Genesis Christian TV that's also available on Moriel, courtesy of Amos Farrell. Please listen to it. Uh, we tried to give a biblical perspective of what's transpiring. The material of service Christus is also responsibly researched in this regard. In the meantime, however, let's remember the coronavirus is a pestilence and Jesus said they would come. Let's not let it be a diversion and take our eyes off of other things. It has so consumed events of the past three to four weeks, we've not even done a twit. We've done multiple reports related to corona. And of course, because Christians are now having to meet in homes or not going to any fellowship at all unless they can communicate by Skype or Zoom, we've been putting out more Bible teaching material, some of it with the help of my dear wife, Pavia. We will continue to do that for the endurance of the present crisis. Nonetheless, we urge prayer for the government of Mr. Johnson in Britain, for Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Gantz in Israel, and certainly for the government, the administration of Donald Trump, that the economy will bounce back once this is resolved. We also pray that God will raise his hand against the government of China. Not against China, and not against the Chinese people. I've been there, there's many wonderful people and many wonderful Christians, but they're being persecuted and repressed by this evil government who allowed this to happen and underreported it. This week in prophecy, thankfully, Mr. Trump withdrew or suspended American support for the World Health Organization, which is a politicized vehicle, not fulfilling its mandate clinically and scientifically, but a mouthpiece for the Chinese Communist Party, who's responsible for this mess. God bless Mr. Trump. May the Lord keep his hand upon him. We don't always agree with him. We do not endorse any political party. We're simply asking for prayer. Thank you so much for listening. And again, to those who are unable to get to church because of the coronavirus, remember, common sense and faith are not mutually exclusive. I had a dear friend die of the virus the week before last, as some of you know, in Pennsylvania. It's real. What's happening with it, though, is affecting the capacity of Christians to fellowship. I hope your church is able to have teaching and fellowship by Zoom or by Skype. And it's a time for families, married couples, to study the scriptures and pray together. It is also an opportunity for homeschooling. The cloud does, as we have said, have a silver lining. God bless and thank you so much for listening. Praise Jesus. He is coming soon. <laughs>